Hello and welcome back for 2023. We are bringing in the new year with a new show, Champ America. It is dead and from its ashes rises the Serer Down Under podcast. Alistair, welcome back. It has been a big couple of months off. Plenty has happened in our time off the air, but we are back with a new show, some new topics, and covering a bit more of the broader Serer community in 2023. How are you feeling, mate? Welcome back. I'm excited. I'm excited. We're finally embracing our Australian roots. Champ America, like you said, that's dead. That's old. The so rare world is too big for us not to explore at all. So, yeah, I'm really excited to kick things off 2023. Yeah, I think we sort of realised as we got towards the back end of the MLS season, there's only so much you can talk about one league when there is so much going on. And like you said, Sarah, there's so much more than just the pinnacle of soccer itself, the MLS competition. We've got the J League, we've got the European season, and potentially in 2023, the A League. Can we make it happen? Can we bring the A League onto the Sarea platform? And then we will truly be giants of the Sarea podcasting world. We are officially starting the petition to bring the A League to Sarea. I think we need to start some kind of little segment where we, you know, count down the days until the A-League is launched. You know, we, we might tweet Nicholas every day until until the A-League comes on board. I know everyone's excited for, for when Prem, but, I mean, come on. It's the A-League that everyone really wants. Well, I think if anyone saw the the uh, the protesters at the Melbourne Derby just a couple of weeks back in the A-League, we could have uh, sent a little video to Nicholas and they're like, this is actually people protesting. They're throwing buckets because they want their, they want Sarair to be coming to the Australian shores. I'm pretty sure that's what I heard the whispers were. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, well, they are doing, you know, the Lord's work then in that case. I thought they were just violent thugs, but it turns out they're just, you know, really passionate Sarair fans. Well, Sarair only apparently wants to onboard leagues that have riots and protests throughout games, you know, Mexico, we get some random weird European leagues. So, you know, now that A-League has finally ticked that box, I think we're ready to take the next step and be able to finally be onboarded. But, um, but look, tell us... Tell us a little bit about the new show, Sarea Down Under. Obviously, like you said, touching on our Australian roots. What can some of the listeners come to expect in the new show for the new year? Yeah, so I think this year, I think last year, obviously, with the MLS, you know, we, we tried to focus a little bit on kind of what was happening in and out with the league. But I think this year we want to try and expand that a little bit more. We want to try and create a show where we've got a few more regular segments. Um, you know, we can involve a little bit more strategy and a little bit more just kind of general Sarair chat. Um, we've got a few, you know, segment ideas that we've been banging around. We've got, you know, strategy corner where we talk about a particular element of Sarair strategy. Um, podium incoming where we talk about our, you know, our best hopes for the weekend ahead. Um, we really want to try and do something where we follow a specific team. So, we want to try and get everyone out there in the Twitter sphere to help us choose some random second division or obscure European or Asian league team that we can now become the biggest fans of. Uh, and we'll basically buy a stack uh, from that team. We'll support them. We'll follow all the journals that follow that team. And we'll basically try and get to know that team inside and out and become their biggest fans um, and hopefully try and, you know, Win some, uh, win some massive rewards with some no-known players from some strange league. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited to, to try some new stuff and just kind of generally talk about, yeah, everything that's going on in the football world as opposed to just MLS. Yeah, because, of course, we're obviously in the middle of the, the build-up to the new MLS season this year, but, of course, there's still all the European leagues going on right now. I know we've got our AZ boys playing over um, in the Eredivisie and mm -hmm. uh, struggling to you know, replicate that early form. We thought we might have been on here with an AZ stack, but I think we've lost our goalkeeper now and a couple of injuries here and there, but um, still getting a little bit of footballing action to keep us uh, occupied before the MLS season starts. But, uh, yeah, there's been plenty happening in the MLS transfer window. I know that we'll touch on that a little bit later with all the, the goings and comings of new players, new teams. I think Sean Johnson's going to Toronto. It's all happening uh, over in the MLS. But, uh, look, first, Alistair, we'll have a... Cast our minds back to the past couple of months. We've been quiet on the airwaves, but of course the World Cup all happened. It was a pretty incredible World Cup at that. I know yourself and my, um, we both watched plenty of action throughout the World Cup at some ridiculous hours, turning away from everyone we love. But uh, look, thoughts on the World Cup that just happened? Uh, 
uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought, um, I think it was probably one of the best World Cups in terms of just the games that were on. You know, it was, there were some pretty incredible matches like, you know, Argentina, Netherlands was unreal. You know, Japan, obviously, the run they went on. Um, and I mean, that the final was just the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. So, yeah, I mean, I love the World Cup. I had, me and my mates had, uh, we got our little Panini sticker books out and we'd, we'd uh, open. We bought like 150 packs of stickers <laughs> on eBay and every game we'd like open another five and yeah, it really took me back to being like a 12 year old again. <laughs> um, so yeah, the World Cup's the best. Uh, what did you think of the Global Cup more importantly? I think it really illustrated the importance of having to have some financial or something tying you to your cards because I think playing with the common cards, yes, it was it was cool and it was a great way for new users to get involved with the platform it's just not quite the same is it no no it certainly lacks that yeah I, i've certainly noticed since normal so rare has been back it's um, much more invested <laughs> uh you know so i think the world cup was it was good to have something going on but yeah it just goes to show that you don't really value what you don't pay for so um yeah, it's the same same with any kind of common league. It just doesn't get the, the blood racing like it does, you know, normally week to week. And one thing I want to touch on as well that you didn't mention is Australia's incredible run in the World Cup. I mean, getting out of that pool, you know, almost pushing Argentina all the way, like that really uh, everyone in Australia all of a sudden cared about soccer once again. Yeah, I mean, that, that Argentina game, I think, the majority of people watching around the world, they probably thought, oh, yeah, Argentina just crushed us, which they did, you know, for 90, 90 minutes of the game, they did just, you know, destroy us. But we got that lucky goal. And then I don't think people will remember how close we were to equalising and then scoring a winner. Like, as Aziz Bayhitch, he, he made an incredible run. And if it wasn't for, I think, the, I think it was Romero's leg, you know, last, last man sliding tackle pretty much saved the day there. And then right at the end, uh, Emmy Martinez, you know, again, Stuck a big arm out and stopped our youngster, um, Garan Qual, from from scoring, which would have been like the last kick of the game. So, yeah, it was exciting that that Denmark game. You know, I was I think I was in a hotel room with my with my fiance, and I was watching it first thing in the morning, and just you know screaming out loud when Matt Leckie scored that goal <laughs> to send us through because I, I was convinced we were we were done when I saw that Tunisia had had beaten France. I thought, oh. There's no way we're going to beat Denmark. I thought we were, you know, just holding on for a draw. So to get the win, that was pretty exciting. And, yeah, it's uh, it's the magic of the World Cup, baby. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. I mean, I think it was the perfect reason to, like, justify just why Sarare can be so important. Like, it was really cool watching all these teams from all around the world. And I knew so many players, like, a ridiculous wealth of knowledge of all these random countries and all these players purely because of Sarare, you get to know them through their cards and, and their leagues that they play in, whereas a lot of people, they only know the big names. Um, so that was a really nice touch and being able to see some of those guys do well. And so when I'm like, oh, my gosh, Shogo Teneguchi is starting for Japan, everyone's like, no. I'm like, no, that's really cool. I mean, I think the big, the biggest one was Enzo Fernandez. You know, the whole world was discovering this new Wonderkin. We were like, please. <laughs> yeah. We've known him from when he played at River Plate. <laughs> it's a really hard one to boast, though, because it's a hard one to bring up in a conversation. Like, oh yeah, well, I actually knew him first. Like, it's really, it's sort of comes across really petty, but we did. We discovered him first. Yeah, yeah. Subtle flex. Subtle flex. Subtle flex. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so new seasons back up and running. Like you said, our our AZ, our AZ boys have started, you know, somewhat middlingly. Um, obviously, you've got pretty much entirely MLS players or America players in your in your gallery so what's kind of uh exciting you for the year what are you uh what are you looking forward to well it's it's interesting like during that off season period you sort of because it's so far away you just sort of forget about those players and like, you know it's still another five months off and all of a sudden you know the countdown's on with the season's almost started i'm looking back through my gallery and i'm going geez i got i got a few good pieces here like you start getting a little bit excited um i think for me though i'm a little bit cautious because i know last season all the guys that I bought who were good the season before turned out to be pretty average. So I'm really worried and interested to see which of my players are going to kick on in 2023 and those that are going to be left behind in, in the past season of 2022. So there's a couple of pieces, I think, like your Lucas Larayans, 
I do think like Semidrisi will still do really well. Um, but there's a couple of pieces like your Claudio Bravo, some of those like left backs and things like that, that I'm going to be interested to see. I think depends on how their team goes, depending on their form for this year. Yeah, it'd be interesting to do a, uh, maybe we can do this next week uh, or closer to the MLS season start date is, is look back at last year and who was kind of the number one, you know, who are the top 10 ranked players, you know, pre-season. Um, I mean, I think you did a pretty good job last season of buying players who finished the previous season on a low, like Zellerayan, you got him for a good price. Um, but I remember, you know, players like Jack Price, Johnny Russell, you know, players that I had in my gallery, uh, they were going for ridiculous prices. And then, of course, they had just, you know, terrible seasons. So it really is a bit of a minefield with MLS, which is kind of why we've ex- hope, we've tried to expand a little bit so we can talk about some other leagues because, you know, MLS can be pretty frustrating at times. But, <laughs> yeah, I'm really interested to see kind of, yeah, who can maintain the form heading into next year. And obviously by talking about other leagues, it means we can expand on, our gallery a little bit more and, and not just have to focus too much on the Champ America side of things. Because, mm. of course, there's the Asian leagues there as well. I've got a couple of Asian defenders and Asian goalkeepers. I know we're both owners of a show Sasaki, which I'm hoping will reap plenty of benefits this year. Yeah, I have his uh, super rare and his rare. Uh, I think you've just got his rare. Um I did see recently that he's uh, re-signed with them, and I think he's the captain this year. So he'll definitely play. Um, but yeah, who knows if he's gonna? You know, do we sell on the preseason hype, or do we just sit tight with Show and hope that he can, you know, keep it going into next year? I do love that you're like, oh no, he's definitely definitely locked in. He's re-signed and he's the captain. I'm pretty sure we had this exact conversation a year ago when I bought Eduardo, and you're like, mate, he's re-signed. Uh, he's the captain. So he's not gone anywhere. And then he immediately got a move to Yokohama. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. (laughs) And then he played once every three weeks for about four months. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a terrifying time of year. Um, You know, the biggest news coming out of my camp, my gallery recently is that I just spent the most I've ever spent on a player. Uh, I have bought a Shinjin Ho uh, super rare. you know, I, I mean, last year he was just such a goat. He would score 70 without a decisive, and then if he got that assist, he'd be 100 guaranteed every week. You know, he's a bit older, but, you know, he's he's the best player in the K-League. So I thought, here we go. He's pretty well-priced. I got him for 2.2 ETH, which I think is pretty good if he can replicate what he did last year. Uh, and as soon as I hit purchase, uh, the next day I saw a Twitter article saying that uh, there's been some complications in his contract renewal and he might be buggering off to some league that I've never heard of. So I am, uh, yeah, it's real squeaky bum time, as uh, Quinny would say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 2.2 ETH, that's about 4500 Australian dollars. It's a fair bit of money to uh, watch someone go over and run around the Saudi league that's not covered. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's a used car, so... <laughs> I mean, once the Saudi league gets announced, I mean, you'll be you'll be laughing. You'll have your Xavier Mercier and all these blokes that you've spent all this ridiculous amount of ETH on that you now finally have back again. Yeah, I mean, well, I think if the Saudi league comes back on, the big winner really will, will be Pavel. Um, he's just going to be, I think his gallery will like triple in value overnight if they announce the Saudi league. Mm, that's a good point, yeah. Mm. So uh, what about kind of every, obviously since we last spoke, lots of stuff has has changed on the platform. Um, Obviously we've had NBA uh, reintroduced, which has been pretty good. Um, What else has happened? Um, The change in the threshold. So obviously now (laughs) limited, limited, you can get your $5 threshold. Uh, they've gotten rid of the lower threshold for rare and, of course, threshold for super rare, which is super exciting. Yeah, the threshold for super rare is pretty exciting for me because I do have a few kind of just, you know, bang average super rares that I've won over the years. So um, I'm hoping I can finally put them to use. Uh, I think super rare might be something that I really try and focus on this year. Um, how do you feel about the capped mode? Do you think you're kind of ready for that? Do you think that's something you'll be trying to focus on? 
I think so. I think it's a good chance to utilize those guys, like you said, that are sort of sitting in your gallery that you're not going to use necessarily in your best team each week. And I think it adds, like you said, I think what I've really liked about this change with the, not only the threshold, but the capped mode is we, our biggest issue was we had these players that if they're not a gun, they just have no value. They lose complete value on the platform. Whereas now, like some of these guys with the lower averages and, you know, not necessarily hitting those high ceilings, all of a sudden they have a use, which then in turn makes them have a value, which is important for smaller users like myself. Yeah, totally. And I think it, it, I think the specialist was good, but you were so restricted by that, you know, having to have two people under 40, you know, one person over 60, it really made it difficult because it meant you had to go out and buy just shit players. Whereas now I think you can have those players that are maybe going through a bit of a lean run and, you know, as they get, as they perform better, you don't then lose access to that competition. You've just got to be a bit more creative with it. Um, and yeah, it just means that each of those rewards you win, you know, even if it's just a, a shitter tier three, it's got some use. You can put it towards making some money back um, for your account. So yeah, I think it's going to be awesome. And I think it's going to stimulate quite a bit of market activity as well, especially in the limiteds in the rares, which is good. Um, and yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to prioritize the rares, Threshold. I'm thinking I'm just, I'll probably just focus on the super rares and then try and have just really strong rare and rare pro teams, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. And apart from your uh, Sinjin Ho, with obviously the January transfer window in full swing, have you had any nasty surprises so far this year? Um, oh, I've had a few worrying moments. Um, a lot of talk of Gustavo Bo, you know, either heading off back to South America or not starting for the Revs, which doesn't make any sense to me. But I think at the moment he's trying to get his green card and, you know, anything to do with green cards, you always worry a little bit, but I think that'll hopefully end up okay. Mauricio Pereira was slated to go to Uruguay, which would have made him a dead card, but he's just re-signed. Um, although he'll be probably sitting back in like a number eight role this year. So I don't think he's going to be quite as useful as he was last year. Um, outside of that, I think all my, all my biggest cards, you know, my, my best boys are all pretty solid. So yeah, I think, you know, and Nicola Storm scored a goal for the first time in, uh, six years. So he's back, baby. It is quite incredibly remarkable. It is a new year, a new Nicola Storm. (laughs) Incredibly remarkable. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think I'm a bit similar, um, as you, like I've, Joisi looks to be sticking around, hopefully, for Austin. He, they've changed him to the number 10 jersey, so hopefully that means that he's there to stay in 2023, which is great news. Uh, Brad Kazan is back, potentially, for Atlanta, which would be incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well done on holding him for that long, by the way. Yeah, I'm not too, I'm not too sure whether they're selling him. He's about 0.27 at the moment. Do I just, like, take that ETH? that was worthless a couple of months ago or wait and see if he actually is going to start. Like I can't see how he starts, but I mean, they obviously love him at Atlanta. Yeah. I think they kind of just got rid of all those guys that they bought last year. I don't, I've everything I've been hearing is that, yeah, he's uh, he'll be, he'll be starting. So, you know, he's obviously a pretty important member of the club. He was their captain. So whether he lasts the whole year, that's probably a different story. Um, but I think if I was you, I would be holding until the start of the season and then potentially if he gets that, well, I guess it's a risk. It's like, do you sell in the build-up on the rumour that he could start or then do you sell on the spike when he does start officially? Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think it's – I'd probably play a bit more safe, I think. I think just in the coming weeks I might sell him – because I did get the profit off selling Bobby Shuttleworth when Gazam went down. So when you combine those two, I've actually done pretty well out of the whole situation. I think I've learnt my lesson from my Lee Bumsu from the Korean League, my limited reward that I won, where um, in all the hype that he was going to get a move, he went up to about 0.025. And then, of course, he got announced that he wasn't getting that move and he was instead going to the K2 and he is now completely worthless forever. So I think it is worth just playing it safe sometimes with goalkeepers because they've been known to cause some heartbreak. Mm-hmm. I think with Lee Bumsu, it's just the same as Gazani. You just, you just hold, especially with goalkeepers. There's, I, I think there's no point ever selling a goalkeeper if they lose their spot because 
you know, you never know what's going to happen. They could get a move to some terrible team and all of a sudden they're the starter again. So always worth holding on to goalkeepers. But as we know, goalkeeper is such a pain. They've literally ruined my life last year. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, you did buy a 40-year-old goalkeeper uh, in old Bolognese there, Enrique Bolognese. Um, so you kind of got what you deserve there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Cool. So have you got any uh, specific goals for the year? Anything you want to try and achieve? Obviously, we we um, helped you buy a bunch of limiteds towards the end of last season with the under the hypothesis that come February this year, they'll be, you know, it'll turn into a gold mine for you. Don't think we've quite seen the gold mine materialise just yet, but the plan is still to sell them, I'm assuming? Yeah, still plan to sell them. I'll sell them regardless, uh, whether come out of it, a loss or a positive. Um, like you said, haven't exactly been the, the gold mine we're after. I've lost Shogo Taniguchi. I've lost Carlos Lamp um, already. So they're now completely worthless. Um, but hopefully we can see, I think, I don't know, maybe it's just a late boom this year or potentially the cards aren't going to go up as much as we've seen in previous years. Um, still yet to be seen. But I think this year is probably just a bit about getting back to trying to enjoy Soraya and, not be uh, so caught up in the frustrations that come with it. I mean, last year was a bit of a nightmare and a real roller coaster, um, starting the year with huge expectations um, and then to be bitterly disappointed week after week uh, became quite frustrating. Mm, yeah, the, the, um, the pitfalls of the MLS, there's just no, no consistency, unfortunately. So trying to pick five players to hit in one week is, is very difficult. What about you, Alistair? Um, look, I think last year saw some pretty high highs and some low lows. Um, I think when ETH was really cruising and the platform was really ticking along, kind of in the massive bull run that we had, you know, my gallery was up, you know, it was in terms of value, it was very high and I probably should have sold off a little bit there. Um, it's since come back down to earth. I haven't had too many big losses, but just with ETH being lower and the kind of general market activity not, you know, just kind of cooling down a little bit, especially in the limiteds, um, the gallery value has taken a bit of a hit. Um, I think this year I really want to, I think I've convinced myself that because I've pretty up until now I've been like buying some ETH, buying some Bitcoin, buying some shares and, you know, putting some money towards Sorare. I kind of had this attitude of, what I've already put into Sorare, I won't touch, and I'm just going to try and keep growing it from there. Um, but I think this year I want to take a bit more of a, an active approach of actually continuing to invest into Sorare. I think there's only, you know, there's big things still to come, and I think I'm at my gallery's at a point where with a few smart purchases, like hopefully the Shinjin Ho will be, <laughs> I can get my gallery to a point where it is returning me rewards on a pretty consistent basis and I can be putting that money to work as opposed to just kind of sitting it, you know, sitting it there as just pure ETH or as pure cash. So, yeah, definitely a growth mindset this year. Uh, I want to try and get that gallery value back up to where it was um, and then potentially, you know, depending on how that goes, then I can start to come up with a bit of a, not an exit strategy, but a strategy where I'm, withdrawing on a regular basis and, and turning it into an income generator as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that sort of moves us into our first uh, strategy corner. of mm. the year. So obviously the strategy corner this year is all about taking the time each week to uh, assess a new strategy that potentially we'll be using this week or moving forward for the new season. So I know uh, Alistair, you and I have recently talked about my potential move into the rare pro this year, obviously with the rare division, uh, especially in America, it's really tough to try and fight. You have to get five players to absolutely smash on that exact week. Rare Pro, you can probably get away with some lower scores as long as three of your main guys go huge. So what are your thoughts on my potential move to Rare Pro? Obviously, it's a fair financial step up to try and get those players, but I think it could be something worthwhile. Yeah, I think... I think if we, I mean, you had a pretty poor lit year last year in terms of results. I think we'll, we can all admit that. Um, but when you did have those good weeks where your players did pop off, 
you were scoring like over 400 points and still winning like a tier two. Like it, yeah. it's become so competitive in, in all-star rare and, and even champ America rare that you have those big weeks where everything happens and you just don't, you don't get the reward. Whereas I've found from my own experience with rare pro, when things go well, you get rewarded. Well, there's better rewards, even though there's less rewards, you get, better cards you know you're more likely to pick up the, those tier ones you know your goalkeepers that kind of thing even if you're not picking up stars like i've only ever won two star awards in my entire career <laughs> um or three actually now three um but those tier ones are so valuable you know if they're worth 0.3 to 0.5 eth uh, that can really accelerate the growth of your gallery and they're usually pretty usable cards so i think for you Focusing on Rare Pro, yes, it'll mean you're probably putting out less teams per week, but it just means that, yeah, you, you're maximising those weeks where everything goes right. Yeah, I think so. And especially, I think, with America, as we've sort of mentioned, the goalkeeper-defender area is something that's really tough um, because it's obviously really hard to find a MLS goalkeeper that's going to be keeping clean sheets on a weekly basis. And I noticed this year, like, I'd be getting 80-plus scores from three of my outfield players, even my defender. But, of course, if you don't get that clean sheet, I mean, you're pretty much impossible to get that tier one. Yeah, yeah. I've realised just in the few weeks that Sarai has been back that the best possible scenario is to have your goalkeeper play on the first day of the weekend um, because then you know what's going to happen um, from, that, from then on. And, of course, as we all know, when your goalkeeper is the last player to play in your team, he concedes. He always concedes. <laughs> uh, so you want to kind of... Get that clean sheet out of the way nice and early but yeah you can't really win without a clean sheet these days um so it is it is tough and i think maybe we need to might might need to look at argentina or or mexico or possibly even brazil um for that goalkeeper option for you and then it's a matter of yeah finding those super rares that are going to actually yeah that are going to be valued well enough because the problem with so super rares is that they're so often completely overvalued so we'll do a bit of uh do a bit of scouting I've, I've put a bit of a watch list together of a few options in the america in the mls particularly um but we can kind of expand on that today and just try and see if we can find some potential options for you do you have a particular budget in mind um well I, i'm going to look to sell a couple of pieces um in the off season i'm not sure when i'm going to buy my uh, super rares if I do end up buying them because obviously I want to sell my rares at the peak at the beginning of the season. But then, of course, that means that the uh, the super rares will be going up the same price. A potential strategy, just quickly, when they bring out the new season cards, could that be the chance to pick up super rares or are they sl so slowly drip fed through that it's not worth it? Um, they def it definitely is slow. Um, I, I mean, it they're not going to bring out the new season cards for a little while, I would say, but definitely you want to try and keep an eye on the auctions. Ideally, that's the best place to buy. So I think what we'll do is if we can come up with a watch list of players that we're happy with, then we just add them as favourites on Soraya and we just keep checking that, that auction list and just have some patience, I think, is the main thing. You know, if you're running a rare team in the meantime, great, and then you just, you know, you have that ETH balance there ready to pounce when the opportunity comes. Um, obviously, otherwise we can just be contacting people and trying to trying to haggle with them on on Discord. But yeah, definitely the auctions is the way to go. Yeah, mm. yeah. But I think it's yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's the high risk, high reward because you're putting you know potentially an ETH into one player that's not a of super high quality. Of course, if they go down, then that's a, a massive blow to your your gallery. It's sort of similar to you know buying your Joeys and those cards, even those rare cards that demand that hefty price tag. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's um, you got to be you got to be very smart with it. I've made the mistake in the past of buying just like super rares that I could afford, um, but they weren't very good players, and that just yeah, it just doesn't work because you can't rely on them. And particularly in rare pro, you're going to be putting your best players in. So I assume for you, you'll be putting in like Zellerion, Dreesy. Carlos Vela, and then maybe, you know, a super rare defender and goalkeeper. If your super rare defender is good some weeks and terrible others, that terrible week can just completely ruin everything. You can completely undo any good work that the other guys have done. So you want to try and find those players that are a little bit under the radar, but are ultimately, you know, good players. 
Lucky Walker Zimmerman's. Lucky Walker Zimmerman's. <laughs> Although he was pretty terrible last year. I also don't think I'm going to be necessarily keeping Drew E.C. and Vela and Co. Okay. Because especially Vela, he's so old, I think. And if LA don't have the year that they had, I I certainly won't be keeping Vela, I can tell you that much right now. Okay. Um, and Jerusi, again, I don't know if I think if I can pick up someone else who's not an ETH and if I can, you know, capitalize on that profit, then I definitely will do that. Yeah, okay. So you're thinking maybe your strategy is if in February market goes bananas, you, you could potentially just clear house and start from scratch. Yeah, not completely from scratch, but yeah, sell some of those those bigger assets um, just to to sort of de-risk because if you can win a reward with a card that's worth half of what Joisi is worth, then you're coming out well on top. I just I just very conscious of the Johnny Russells and and the Jack Prices of 2021, and I don't want Joisi and Vela to be those kind of guys. Okay. I think you probably got more risk with Vela than you do with Joisi, just because Joisi is such a crucial member of, you know, Austin. And I think I don't think too much has changed there. I think with, if we, and we'll, again, we'll probably do this next week, but analyze what went wrong for those kind of players that dropped right off. I mean, for Johnny Russell, Polito was out, you know, and Gaddy Kinder was out, and that just kind of completely crippled Sporting KC from the get go. Uh, they didn't have any good players, so it just meant that Johnny Russell couldn't get those assists. He didn't get that many pens that he could take, you know. So, and then with Jack Price, he was injured all year. So, I think it's worth looking at, kind of doing a bit of forecasting and going, okay, what could go wrong? Uh, you know, with Vela, obviously, he's old, he's chubby. They've got so many other good young players. Potentially, he could play every second week, and that's a nightmare, you know. So that's someone definitely you can sell at a peak for sure. Uh, with Dreesy, you know, yes, he could drop off a little bit. Is there anyone that's coming in that's going to take over? Probably not Jassy Zardes, <laughs> but does Zardes, is Zardes a better, you know, is Zardes going to um, help Dreesy or hinder him, you know? Well, if Dreesy moves to the number 10 role, is that like just little things like that? It's a change slightly mm. potentially, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. So, yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think selling at the peak is always a good strategy, but we've just got to make sure that you've got, you know, strategy to buy back in again you know it would be a shame to sell Dreesy and then not be able to get back in because he just continues doing what Dreesy does <laughs> yeah. especially because you did get him for such a good price so you know potentially that risk is built into that a little bit so you could just hold but yeah. we'll see we'll see of course there's also the option of selling at a high and then going in and trying to buy some some more stable Europeans um you know as their season kind of, you know, doesn't wind down. They st still play till June, so still plenty of utility you can get there. So potentially you could just stick to All-Star and, you know, um, yeah, try and find some of those players that are a little bit deflated in price. Yeah, I know we'd sort of spoken about that strategy at the back end of last year, and that's something I'd certainly be happy to do because I do want to get into European football a bit more and just... Um... Major League Soccer, and like you said, just having a bit of stability, not only in my goalkeepers and defenders, but um, just with some more quality options. Obviously, transfer transfers are probably a little bit more of an issue there because they can just go anywhere in Europe. Um, but I think, yeah, that could certainly be something to look at as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, well, I think we'll continue to make a bit of a watch list of just players generally. Um, but for today, we're just going to look at some of the... Um, potential super rares you could pick up if you were to run an America pro team. So, um, you know, let's assume you've got three strong rares, which I think you do across the board. So it's just a matter of getting some super rares to complement that. So, all righty. So these are a few options that I've pulled up, but we'll also just kind of run through the rankings of players and, and, um, and see what we can find. So I'll go through each of these. So I've got, I've tried to get a bit of a blend of different positions. Um, Jesus Jimenez um, obviously hasn't scored very well of late. Uh, you can pick up his super rare for 0.685 at the moment, but I reckon you could probably talk someone down to about 0.4.5. He didn't score a goal pretty much since as soon as um, Bernadeschi and uh, Insigne came in. He basically just went to nothing and didn't score a goal. 
Uh, you can see pretty much 283 there is where Insigne came in, <laughs> and then he just did nothing. But he is still probably going to be their starting striker um, playing next to Insigne in Bernadeschi, so he could get he could be a real beneficiary of that. And as we know with strikers, they go on hot runs, they go on cold runs. And you can see here his hot run prior to Insigne coming back coming was pretty amazing. He was scoring goals and assists pretty much every week. So um, that would be a little bit more of a risky one. Um, Robin Lord, I think, is one who's uh, pretty underrated uh, as a player. He's, I think he can buy his forward card as well. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but he's someone who, if, you know, especially if Reynoso goes to jail <laughs> or, or back to Brazil, you know, Robin Lord can really step up again. Um, scores pretty good AA. Um, and, you know, it's usually there or thereabouts with assists, probably not as much last season, but pre season before that he was he was really well involved. So that's another one of just kind of like picking a player that will revert to the mean a little bit. Uh, what else we got in here? Maxi Morales could be a bargain. I know he's gone to Argentina, but if he starts for racing, then, you know, he could potentially still be just as good as he was in New York, if not better. Um, so that one might be just one to keep an eye on. Uh, Jamiro Montero, probably a little... Oh, 1.15 is not too bad for Montero. I think... I mean, you've already got his rare. I think he's going to smash this year. I think he's going to be in a more settled team. Hopefully San Jose are a little bit better than they were last year. I think they're trying to sell Kakanovic, so hopefully they bring in, you know, Either Cade Cow steps up or they bring in someone that can kind of latch onto those Jamiro Montero through balls. I think last year the problem was he was setting them up and no one was knocking them down. Yeah. Um, and we know what he can do. Like, he was a little bit up and down last year, but we know that he can have those really big peak scores. You know, got 100 there, got some 80s. You know, he, uh, he definitely could have, you know, a good second year. Um, who else we got here? Antonio Carlos could be a great option to pick up at defender. 0. 0.441 at the moment, which is a bit of a bargain. Um, I assume he's staying at Orlando. Um, he got injured last year and then kind of came back but wasn't quite you know, himself. Um, but if we look at his scores prior to his injury, you know, there's some big dark greens in there. He's pretty consistent, and he's a good player. Like, you watch him, he's a, he's a good defender. So definitely one to, to keep an eye on there. Uh, and I think that's probably the, the biggest bargain of the lot so far is Antonio Carlos. Uh, Gressel, definitely one I think could have a massive year. Let's have a look at his scores. 0.5 is going for, which is pretty good. Get his SO5 scores. So he wasn't great at where was he before Vancouver? DC. DC. And obviously DC sucks, so he was gonna struggle there. Um if you look at his scores just for the white caps, you know, obviously a few games to get his get himself settled. And then he was kind of smashing, you know. Even without a decisive, he's scoring sixty. He's gonna be playing on the wing, he's got gold, he's got, you know, some pretty exciting youngsters up front that he can be trying to whip balls into. I think he could be a real, like, Brooks Lennon type this year. So that would definitely be one that I would I would look at picking up. Um, again, with his super rare, if he bangs an 80, if he bangs an 82, you're well on your way to winning something there. So yeah, yeah. definitely you want those players who are capable of the big dark greens. Obviously, right. you're going to get the odd orange one as well. But, yeah, Gressel for sure, and I think... If it's the same guy that's selling it, I think he had it up for 0.7 yesterday. So he's obviously trying to get rid of it. So he could be a good person to be, you know, hitting up in the Discord and offering him some some low balls. Yep, yeah, nice. Uh, Shakiri could be a bit of a punty one, um, just over an ETH. If you could get him for just under an ETH, I think, you know, same with Montero. Could be... Just be second year syndrome and he could he could start flying now that he's hopefully settled uh, i mean it's it's shakiri he's he's an unbelievable player and i think he didn't really do what everyone expected him to last year so that could be one where it really pays off if he can you know match the potential that we know he can he's only 31 so plenty of time 
Um, oh boy, Walker uh, Zim. Walker <laughs> Zim. Yeah, yeah. Walker Zim was really un- he was really underwhelming last year. Um, but you know he's always got that opportunity to score goals because he's always up in the box on corners and stuff like that. So too expensive at a whole eighth though. Um, oh, I think that's pretty good for Zimmerman, but the other risk with Zimmerman is I think, I mean, he's 29, so he's probably just going to be in the MLS, but I wouldn't rule out him being like, I'm in the USMNT team, I'm Walker Zimmerman, I'm going to go and try and play in Italy or something, you know, and then he's dead. So uh, just because he's got that national team pedigree, I'd say he's probably a little bit of a risk of leaving, so that could be that risk as well. Yeah. Uh, Espinosa, I think, would be a pretty cheap, um, you know, good value option as a midfielder. He's nothing amazing, but he does get involved a lot, and I think he takes pens, and he's kind of pretty involved, as you can see there. He's kind of scoring those decisives pretty regularly. So if you can get him for maybe 0.5, 0.6, I think that would be a bit of a bargain. I do love me some uh, San Jose Earthquakes action too, so... <laughs> yeah, you get it's you, you're going to see some goals. It's going to be exciting. I wouldn't be buying any San Jose defenders, but on the attacking side, yeah, fill your boots. <laughs> um, all right, Yimmy Chara. I don't know what he would be selling for. If you can get his forward card, I think he was pretty terrible last year. But you know, Yimmy's pretty good. And if you, like I said, if you can get his forward card, I think that you know, because super rare forwards are so hard to come by, I think he would be a good option there. Brooks Lennon, I think he's going to have a massive year. I don't, again, I don't know what he would be selling for these days, but I think last year he pretty much was playing up front, um, which meant he had some terrible games, but it also meant he had, you know, towards the back end of the year, yeah, some some nice big dark greens there. So, in a similar mould to Julian Gressel, I think Julian Gressel's probably a little bit better, if I'm honest. Um, alrighty. What else we got? Uh, and then I've got a couple of just like boring midfielders that aren't going to set the world on fire, but potentially if you've got some good pieces around them, they can just be that like kind of more settled super rare that gets you those 60s every week. You know, it's not going to necessarily put you in the podium, but they're not going to roll out those 30s that can really ruin your whole game week. Um, Mark Delgado at um, LA, <clears throat> you know, pretty consistent you know you're going to get those 60s and 70s pretty much every week um if he can somehow latch onto an assist then he gets that dark green so that could be definitely one to look at um john motta at miami i think you could probably get him for pretty cheap um same thing just super consistent like look at that you can draw a line through that and it's not going to change much so Again, that kind of depends on the players you've got around him. And I think with someone like this, if you had this super rare and then one other that was maybe like a Julian Gressel type, you can, you may not, like I said, you're probably not going to hit those podiums, but you can be pretty regularly churning out tier ones and tier twos with these kind of players as long as you've got the right pieces around them. Yep. Because, yeah, like you said, you don't want to – That's that was the most frustrating thing this year is you'd be so excited because Zella hit 100 and – you know, Vela would pump out another 80, but then, yeah, being let down by guys, if they just get like a 55 or a 60, it's okay. Mm. It's not amazing, but it's just what, yeah, like you said, when they get that 35, you're just dead. That's it, yeah. And as a super rare, 55 is, you know, that's a it's a good score. So maybe a strategy for you could be to go with one kind of more risky you know, high risk, high reward kind of super rare and then get one that's a little bit more stable so that you're not, you know, in that situation you were last year where Zeller would go off, Dreesia would go off and Vela would suck or, you know, vice versa. You'd always have that one guy that let you down. So maybe this year you need to focus on a little bit more balance in your teams where you've got your reliables and then you've got your match winners that will put you up into the high tier ones. Yeah. Yeah, do you think that for the super rares, is it better for me to have a defender and a midfielder super rare and then have my forward, mid, and goalkeeper rare? Because obviously I I, I can't afford a top-tier goalkeeper for a super rare, let alone a rare. I think is it better to not put too much ETH into a super rare goalkeeper instead just get a rare goalkeeper and, like you said, try and use some of these more 
value midfielders to be able to get that extra super rare card? Yeah, I think with your strategy, like I run a well, I have I have a couple of super rare goalkeepers that I'll probably just be running in the super rare division this year. But last year I certainly wasn't averse to having the super rare goalie and defender. Um, just because if your goalie gets a clean sheet, you know, we as we know, you need a clean sheet in order to to compete. Um, if he gets a clean sheet as a super rare, brilliant, you're on. You know, especially if you've got you know some really good outfielders to go around him. Um, whereas even if he doesn't, as long as he can score some good AA, you can still get like 70 points out of your goalkeeper. So I would only suggest to do the super rare goalkeeper if you've got you know absolute weapons in the outfield that are going to consistently hit those 80s, 90s, 100s that you need. You know, so if you've got like a Tadic up front, you know, then you don't want to try and if it's gonna if it's gonna damage your team to spend most of your budget on like a midfielder that's not actually gonna be guaranteed to hit you big scores, then it can be smart to just go goalkeeper defender and then spend your money on really consistently performing rares yeah. uh, in the outfield. But I think for your strategy, I think again with MLS, it's just yeah, you, you just can't be guaranteed of that clean sheet, so it might be worth, yeah, picking up a, a keeper that's a little bit more consistent. Um, I think for you, you, you want to look at ideally like Jerisi if you don't sell him, maybe Zellerayan or maybe move to, you know, try and pick up a European midfielder that you can be a little bit more reliant on. Um, and then, yeah, a strong mid or defend, strong mid and defender super rare, I think would be your best best option. Yeah, yeah. So this is obviously just MLS. Uh, I'll do a bit more research into some other players. I think in Europe, you've just got a lot more um, uh, kind of choice. You know, you've got you've got players that are like this guy here. I think was um, featured on the Looking Up with Laird podcast. This is someone that I own, um, Andre Girotto. Point six for his super rare. You could probably get him for a little bit less than that. But then if you look at his scores. Like he's pretty pretty consistent, you know, uh, and I think Europe has a lot more of those kind of undervalued gems uh, that you can pick up. So I'll do a bit of research and see if there's anyone that we could look at picking up there as well. Obviously, then you run the well, you're running an all star rare pro, which means you're up against some big boys. Uh, so I guess it's up to you whether you want to focus on America and just have that kind of reduced competition field, or whether you want to yeah, branch out a little bit and maybe try and pick up some players that are a little bit more consistent, but you've got more people to compete against. You can basically never win. Never win what? Well, if you go, if you go into all-star rare pro, you can never win. You probably can't win, no. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to have something miraculous happen, but all, uh, America rare pro, you definitely can and you can do it with without spending a crazy amount of money yeah yeah with mls particularly and i'd say you could probably extend, extend that to champ america the whole region you can't just buy a win you really just you do need a lot of luck there's not there's not really anyone that you can be like if i buy this player then i will crush you know for a while there it was hulk um but he's he's dropped off a little bit Mukhtar maybe, but I, I don't think anyone will really feel confident having Mukhtar in their team, even though he has just been scoring goals for two years straight. <laughs> um, I guess there's a couple like Insigne, Carlos Hill, obviously. But, but yeah, you're definitely relying on a lot more luck in Champion America. I'm glad you finally come around, because I think I said that to you a couple of weeks ago, and you were like, no, it's, it's no, you can. But I was like, it is. It's, it's true. Like, in terms of bang for buck, like, I think with America, you can put in a more fluky sort of team. Some of those guys, like your, your left backs that, you know, because it's such an attacking league, I think you can get away with having more undervalued hit and miss guys and chucking them into your America team than trying to rely on guys to, like you said, consistently week in, week out, pump out the big scores, and if they're not getting a decisive, they're at least still getting 65. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. So I think, yeah, it's really defender and goalkeeper that let people down in America. You know, there's, there's just even looking through this list, 
there's no one that I would be like, yep, I'm confidently put my house on them, you know, scoring well every week for me. So there's no there's no Otamendi's. No, there's no Otamendi's. That's right. <laughs> Who's this guy? <clears throat> this guy does all right. It's going for an ETH. Yeah. Oh, he played fully on. That's why. Interesting. Anyway, all righty. Well, look, I think I think that's some good options to start with. <clears throat> I think you mentioned you've got a bit of ETH in your, ba- in your balance. I reckon you should be trying to get under this Julian Gressel. Um, I'm assuming he'll start for uh, for Vancouver. Maybe we need to do a little bit of digging, but I think he would be just he's the example of a perfect super rare for you to start making that move up. Mm. Also, keep in mind that you don't have to have two super rares. If you've got one super rare and then you've got weapons in your outfield, sometimes that can be better than just buying a you know a super rare midfielder that's not that good for the sake of it. You know, like let's let's assume that Vela does start and continues to be Carlos Vela. If you've got Vela, Druisi, and Zellerayan and they all bang out a ninety, that's better than having a Lewis Morgan score a 50 as a super rare. So don't feel like you need to buy two super rares straight away. You could potentially start with one and just kind of, yeah, go for more consistent, safer performers around him. Yeah, yeah. We'll, look, we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll keep playing it by ear and keep doing the research. Still got how long we got left till the season starts? Ages. Um, oh. February 25th, I think, which doesn't sound like too far away, but in Soraya years, that's, yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> Look at those scores from Carlos Vela. 77, 88, 70. He's 33. I mean, I mean, Bale has announced his retirement today. I don't know if you saw that. I did, yes. Mm, so no more Bale, not that he was doing anything anyway, but I'll be interested to see what happens with Vela. I mean, he's still going to take pens, you would have to think. He still scores such good, like, in terms of AA, he's oh, he's pretty much a dream forward. So, I mean, I, I understand why you would want to sell him, but I don't know. We'll see, we'll see what that price does. If he goes to an ETH, then I'd say, yeah, go for him. But if he doesn't get too much above what he is at the moment, I don't think there's – I think there's – you're missing out on potentially, you know, another great Carlos Vela season. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, look, it's been good to be back for, for 2023. We're back. We're back with a bang. Um, and here's to uh, endless winnings in 2023, I'm sure. Nothing can go wrong. All our planning is going to pay off, and we're going to become the kings of Sarah and the kings of the Sarah podcasting world. Again. All right, mate. Well, look, we'll catch you on next week's ep. We'll keep doing some digging in the meantime, and like I said, we'll see you next week. Absolutely. Bye-bye.